Um, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited for another one of our Oikos Presents Sustainable Finance Topics. And I'm really excited to have Fanny here to share with us on biodiversity and finance. Um, Fanny, I'm not gonna give your intro because I think you can share it the best. Um, but I will say that I'm really excited that you as a prior Oikos member and an Oikos alumni are here to support us um, and share your vast knowledge. I think it's really cool that there are people who are working in this and you're providing the next generation, the information that we can work in this space. So how about you take it away? Thank you, Stephen. Um, and thank you uh, all of you for your introductions and I'm really happy to, to be there today. Um, I'm just gonna, can you see my screen? Yes. Right. Yes. Um, just a few words on who I am. Uh, I did a master in business management at EDEC uh, Business School in France. Uh, then I did uh, gap year uh, six months uh, in my current consultancy, uh, BL Evolution, where I was uh, working on CSR, not really biodiversity, but more the, the broader CSR consultancy, a traditional approach. And I also had the chance to go and be a business developer in Buenos Aires for uh, six months, which was really nice and started to, to make me work on uh, aquaponics and uh, this kind of uh, urban farming, uh, which was really interested. Uh, and then I went to Finland uh, to work uh, for uh, to finish my uh, master degree because in, in France at the time in uh, 2018 2019 it was uh, not so easy to get some interesting master degrees on sustainability so I went to Finland uh, to Hengen School of Economics and I had the chance to, to study supply chain sustainability in the supply chain it was pretty interesting and when I came back to France, I uh, reached back to Belle Evolution, uh, where I did my internship and I uh, had a chance to become a CSR and biodiversity consultant and start to work on the biodiversity topic just because they needed it at the time. And it was nice to like they just needed someone to take this part at this time so i just dig in and started to to work um on uh, how companies can work on biodiversity and uh, we had um, a short mission for uh, french um, governance um, um, body that uh, was trying to build uh, some guidelines for small companies, how they can work on biodiversity. So I built guidelines uh, for the six first months uh, I was at BL on how to work on biodiversity when you are a company. And that's how I really started to, to work on the topic. And for the last three years now, I've been a fully biodiversity consultant. Um, I don't do any uh, CSR overview anymore. I, I'm fully dedicated to biodiversity uh, footprint assessment. We will talk about uh, that a bit more and a biodiversity strategy. And uh, for a bit more than a year now, I've started to work with um, investor as well as companies. So, um, starting to work on how does it look like to work on portfolios and uh, to try to assess biodiversity footprint on portfolios and and all of that. And I'm really happy to to be able to to share this uh, workshop with the with the Oikos community because I had the chance to be in Oikos Lille for a while when I was uh, in EDEC uh, Business School. And then I had the chance to be in Oikos Helsinki that was not doing so well at the time, but uh, trying to, to revive it while I was uh, doing my uh, my year there. And then I've been trying to be uh, active as an Oikos alumni and trying to, to keep up with the French network. But uh, it's hard to, to keep up when you, you have so much to do as a consultant, but uh, trying to, to do my part. and I've, seen some of the alumni uh, a few months ago and we are trying to to keep up the the, the French alumni network but it's uh, it's not so easy to do as everybody is uh, everywhere in France and not all of them are in Paris but 
I'm really happy to to be able to to share my uh, current scope of work with you and to, to talk a bit more about uh, biodiversity uh, for financial institutions. Uh, the goal of this workshop will be to for you to understand what could be nature related risks and opportunities and to uh, understand how to identify them and how to manage them for a financial institution. Uh, hopefully we can get that as interactive as possible, especially considering that we are a small group. I think uh, it would be great uh, to open mic. You will see I have some question. I said put it in the chat, but maybe we can uh, also have it as open mic uh, as we are not too many. Uh, we will uh, work first on uh, having uh, what is biodiversity and what are the main concerns. And then we will uh, work a bit on the risks aspect and understanding how we can identify it uh, with tools such as uh, the Anchor database or the biodiversity risk filter. So we, have, we will have a small activity where you will be able to use those tools. And uh, then we will go more in depth on what you can do at each phase of an investment. So when you are in acquisition phase, then when you are uh, in the holding periods, and then when you are in exit phase, what can you do to um, make sure that you take into account biodiversity? And then we will have some concluding remarks. Uh, hello, Joel. Um, hi, hi. Is there any uh, questions before we begin on the planning or any comments? No, good. Uh, so quickly, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is often seen as the next big thing. Uh, we hear a lot about climate change and now we are starting to hear a lot about biodiversity collapse uh, because obviously, um, the extent to which we have uh, started to um, to damage our planet is not only on climate, but we are starting to to really damage nature also, and biodiversity collapse uh, will have huge impacts uh, on our um, on our societies and economies. And yeah, just a, a small um, thing, just to when we we have seen that. Uh, people started to talk about recession and climate change during COVID, but uh, we're often forgetting that biodiversity collapse is also a reality and not something that is far away. Um, do you know what is biodiversity and what does it mean to you? Maybe you can put one to two word uh, in the chat so we can see what you think when you think about biodiversity and then we can see the the definition. Uh, there will be some question. I will ask you. It's easier to use the chat, I think, for this kind of thing. So just we don't uh, speak all at the same time. But if you want to give a more elaborate uh, answer, obviously you can open your mic. Uh, Stefan proposed that it's uh, just simply all of animals and plants. Uh, Martin proposed for uh, ecological balance. So if you propose the soup of life. <laughs> and Stephen say that it's also maybe referring to having healthy ecosystems. Uh, Mariana, sleeping uh, beings from microbes to plants, animals, etc. And uh, Jacob's is a variety of life on Earth. She can say also soil, maybe. <laughs> Great. Um, I think you, you, you get, uh, it's good because you get already a broader vision. Often when I ask what is biodiversity, what people get in mind is all the beautiful animals that we have on Discovery Channel and uh, we have in front of magazines, uh, but biodiversity is way more than that. There is also all of the thing that we don't put in the magazines because it's not too, too great to look at. Uh, but it, there is also a lot of 
things, uh, animals, plants that we cannot see just because uh, they are too far away from us or uh, to microscopics. Uh, this is a tardigrade, for example, just the, the size of um, a, a bed bug. I don't remember the word, but it's really microscopic. It, it can live uh, in space. Here you have some uh, fishes that lives in uh, frozen seas, or you have some um, uh, species that lives uh, really far away in the oceans. So uh, you have uh, also a lot of biodiversity that you don't think about just because you you never never seen them. So often when we think of biodiversity, we think of the sum of old plants and animals and old species, but uh, biodiversity is uh, a bit more than ju just a sum of living species. It's uh, really another word to speak about the living world and uh, biodiversity uh, is considered as all the living thing. So really the superfly in terms of is a great definition, but uh, it's really all uh, the living thing on our planet, but also biodiversity is taking into account all the interactions that you can have between uh, all the species, but also all the genetic diversity you can have within a species. Uh, for example, uh, around this uh, virtual table, we are uh, really different, and this is uh, genetic diversity among the, the human uh, the human race. So we have uh, this to take into account and all the relationship we can have between individuals and between species and also the diversity of ecosystems that supports all this diversity of species and diversity of genetics. Why do you think biodiversity is important and what do you think it can provide to, to society or it provides um, usually to society? Um, do you see stuff uh, around you that is provided by biodiversity or what do you do you think it can provide to your current maybe jobs or or activity sector or a study sector why is it important can you write uh, in the chat um, your vision on that It's a harder question than just the biodiversity definition. Uh, seventh, the scientific knowledge, like learning from animals, use uh, this in medicine, for example. Yes, that's a really good example of a uh, thing that biodiversity brings to us. There are lots of other examples I think we can find. Uh, biodiversity provides a healthy balance of life, life on Earth, supporting the ecosystem, natural cycles, and maintain the pH balance of Earth. And that is also really true and uh, one very important aspect. Uh, and let's go with what Sophie is saying to maintain, to continue life on Earth. Um, the conservation of species, which is uh, true, but uh, more what does it give to, to us if we are not in a really ethical point of view, but just in a material po point of view, that was more of my question. Is there any other idea before I give you an overview of what the, the, the scientists say <laughs> about all of this? Health in general, yes. I think between um, Mariana and Stefan, we have uh, two main aspects and we're still missing one, but um, I, I can give you the answer. Um, the IPD, uh, IPBS, uh, the International Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, the, the biodiversity uh, version of the IPCC, uh, has worked on uh, assessing biodiversity and ecosystem services and they propose to uh, divide the, the ecosystem services in three categories. Um, the first one is uh, the regulation of environmental processes. So just what uh, Mariana was saying, uh, because biodiversity provides 
uh, habitat creation provides pollination and dispersal of seeds, provides regulation of air, climate, ocean, freshwater, um, soil uh, hazards and extreme events, and also um, some uh, pests and other problems uh, from ecological processes. Uh, but you have also have the providing of non-material thing, uh, just like Stephen was saying, learning and inspiration, but also physical and psychological experiences, uh, or also supporting identities. A lot of cultures uh, are based on some animals, on some plants, and so there is also a lot of cultural aspects linked to, to biodiversity. And also one that you didn't mention, but we do not uh, eat anything that is not uh, from something that has lived at some point. We do not eat stone. So uh, obviously all our food comes from biodiversity uh, and a lot of, also of materials uh, such as um, uh, some uh, natural fibers or wood or uh, anything that comes from plants. Uh, is uh, or also um, laser, for example, is uh, comes from biodiversity and medicine also, and some kind of energy. Not all of it uh, relies on biodiversity, but uh, all the wood-based energy, for example, rely on biodiversity. Or, for example, uh, um, uh, water-based energy can also rely on, bio on biodiversity because you will need the regulation of the fresh water. Uh, for example, to get constant uh, energy from that. Uh, so this is a quick overview of what nature provides. Um, do you, from that, can you see a bit what comes from biodiversity in this picture? Uh, it's a little exercise I, I, I like to do because there is often more, a bit more than what we can see. Um, yeah, like Maria said, everything almost. Well, there is um, one thing that is not, uh, no, two things that are do not come from biodiversity. No, yeah, two, two or three, it depends on what you count exactly. Yeah, uh, plastic from the chair and the table. It was biodiversity a long, long time ago, but if biodiversity stops uh, today, uh, it will change nothing on our ability to, to have more plastic. So uh, plastic is not considered as coming from biodiversity. Yes, the other thing in the metals in theory, and there is um, a third thing, Maybe you can find it. That does not come from biodiversity or certain uh, except from metal and um, and the plastic. I don't know it what in what the plate is made of, but yeah, maybe the plate uh, also. But I was thinking of uh, the glass from the bottles and, and the, the glass. Um, so glass, it can come from some shells, but uh, mostly it's just minerals and um, it's not considered as uh, biodiversity. But everything else, um, the, the wheat you need for the bread, uh, the, the grapes you need for the wine, um, the, the milk you need, uh, and the cows you need, uh, to, to make the cheese or the goods you need to make the cheese and even the corks uh, from uh, here or the, the textile to the, the cotton to, to make the, the cloth is uh, all of this come from biodiversity obviously. Um, so as you probably know and as I was saying biodiversity is not at a good stage right now um, if you look at the planetary boundaries that I'm sure most of you are uh, familiar with, uh, we have biosphere integrity here, and this is um, the, the, the one that reflects uh, biodiversity loss and uh, the extinction rate, and we can see that we are way outside of the state of operating space, and this is one of the most alarming uh, planetary boundaries that we have um that we have uh, overpassed 
uh, right now. Uh, sorry, this is not the updated ver version because we have also passed the, the green water uh, use uh, boundary uh, last year. But uh, yeah, uh, biodiversity is one of the planetary boundaries that we are way above the safe operating space, meaning that we are at a critical time. Uh, I don't know if you have this number uh, in your mind, but um, do you have an idea of how much biodiversity has been lost over the past 50 years uh, in percentage of loss among wildlife populations? This is uh, something that has been uh, published uh, by the, the WWF. Um, I think it was in... 2016, the first time they published this. Uh, Mariana says 66%, Stephen says one third. Is there any other ideas? The others you, you don't know, you have no idea. There is a huge gap between one third or 66. Which uh, side would you be, be on? Yeah, it's quite critical to, to put a number on it. And yeah, uh, so yeah, Giacomo is uh, willing to, to believe in Stefan and, uh, and go with uh, closer to, to one third. Um, unfortunately, we are really close to what um, Mariana said, and even worse than uh, what you said. Um, the WWF has, has been following um, species for a long, long time, uh, 50 years, and they have observed a loss of 69% uh, of the supervised animals, so meaning not that 69% of uh, species have died, but in the quantity of animals, in the quantity of individuals, they've seen a uh, loss of 69% uh, of, of wildlife. And you, if you have only one number uh, to, to, to keep from that, uh, I think it's a good uh, number to, to think of because it shows really how alarming it is. Uh, more than two thirds of uh, animals in 50 years, uh, it's a pretty, pretty huge and alarming number. Yeah, Stephen, you, you have a... Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, why do you think it's important that we put a number to how much is being lost here? Um, and like, how, how could we even estimate that? It seems like something that's just beyond being able to estimate um, when we really don't know um, all of those interactions that are happening between all of these ecosystems. Yeah, uh, I think it's just because uh, often we we use this this uh, this number the about uh, one fourth of the species we know are um, currently at risk of extinction, but this doesn't does only cover the the species that are at risk of extinction, and we cannot I think until we have this number this sixty nine or seventy percent number in mind we cannot really apprehend uh, how much wildlife we have we are losing and that it's not only uh, gold species that are disappearing but really individual and within uh, some species population we are losing each day individuals within those population so the quantity of wildlife that we have is significantly reducing um, and this is what I think is alarming. Obviously, there is there are some new species every time, and it's continuous and it's a development. But uh, here, it's not a small number. You know, 60, 70 percent almost of uh, the the supervised animal population that have disappeared in fifty years. It's really huge, and it shows really the rate at which it is uh, disappearing. And um, yeah, I think it's it's a really it's a way to see it as really something alarming and that you can really compute in your head like you have 
10 uh, animals in front of you, like uh, 10, I don't know, birds that you will sit uh, every day on your um, on uh, the trees next to your house. And to think that in 50 years, uh, seven of them will be killed. And this is a representation of what is happening in the world. I think it shows a bit uh, what we are facing uh, uh, right now. Um, some other numbers that you have may have heard, but um, that you don't need to, to, to keep in mind, but uh, um, more than one third of fishery stocks are overexploited. 75% uh, of Earth's surface is significantly altered. Um, there is a lot of forest loss. Uh, this is the number from 20. 10 to 2015, but uh, um, I have been um, reminded that uh, in 20, uh, 2022, but 2020, uh, we are way more uh, than that. And uh, each year we are losing millions of hectare hectares of primary uh, forest. Um, and yeah, I, as I was saying, among the species we know uh, about one fourth is uh, currently at risk of extinction. Um, there is a factor of resilience for biodiversity. Uh, it's important to get in mind that um, um, biodiversity is way more resilient than uh, climate, for example. Climate, every, um, every emission of greenhouse gas that you put in the atmosphere, it will basically stay there or being absor absorbed, but basically it will stay there and each degrees it's gain and you cannot really come back from that. Uh, and it's more something you have to stop. Biodiversity, we have the change that is living and uh, it's really resilient, meaning that if you apply pressure on biodiversity, it will move, but it can come back in a place. That's what, what we've seen, for example, in um, Chernobyl after the catastrophe, we've seen that the plants are coming back and taking over the concrete and the city. So uh, it's possible and it's really easy, it's just a matter of uh, a few years, a few decades uh, for biodiversity to, to gain back and come back um, in the world. Um, but uh, what I've been identified that there is a tipping point uh, where you can just go, go from one state to another state. And um, one example of that is uh, the Amazonian forest. Um, it, is, um, it is keeping the way it is because uh, uh, trees are just, um, how do you say, they are putting water in the air. Uh, every time and they are maintaining a water uh, level around them but there will be one point where we will have uh, cut one tree um, one tree too much and then we will uh, have a state where there is not enough water that is maintained at this point and and uh, the Amazonian forest could transform into a desert such as the one of Sahel, for example. And this has been uh, proved by a scientific research that we could go from an Amazonian forest to Sahel uh, in, a, uh, in the same spot on Earth, uh, just because we would have uh, come from, um, from a tipping point that we don't really know exactly where this tipping point point will be. Uh, yeah, Joao seems to have the, the numbers, maybe it's, uh, yeah, when we will have the first seat, but 40% and we are currently maybe at 20, so um, yeah. Uh, and it's the same with the acidity in the ocean. Um, the more acidity we put in the ocean, the best it is for jellyfish, for example, and an ocean full of jellyfish is a viable ecosystem. But it's not something that we want <laughs> because we do not eat a lot of uh, jellyfish and we are not used to have um, um, a notion full of, uh, of jellyfish. So there is a tipping point where uh, the ocean will be too um, acidic to, to have fish in it and where jellyfish may uh, be more prosperous and that they could feel uh, the ocean, um, what there is to understand is that it doesn't change anything for biodiversity. 
uh, a dessert is still full of life, uh, a sea full of jellyfish is still full of life, but what you change is our capacity to, to, to use and to live in this environment. And biodiversity loss is really um, more of a human problem uh, at the moment because we are losing the ecosystem we live in uh, and we are losing all the ecosystem services that are provided and that we just seen uh, just before. Um, and obviously, <laughs> um, this biodiversity loss doesn't come from nothing. So it's important to, to know a bit where does it come from. Maybe you have uh, heard of the five main drivers for biodiversity loss. You have an idea of what they can be, what they are. What are the main pressure on biodiversity? Yes, monoculture uh, could be one. It's not expressed uh, like that, but uh, it's definitely one big part of uh, biodiversity loss, uh, as is cattle breeding and cattle feeding also a lot. Runoff to the oceans, killing coral reefs. Yes. Um, in fact, what has been identified as the five main drivers for biodiversity loss still by uh, from the IPBES uh, in their assessments in 2019 uh, is that uh, we are driving uh, first land and sea use change, exactly what you said, um, monoculture and changing the way uh, the way uh, the sea looks and changing um, our use of terrain. Um, this is the first driver for biodiversity loss for um, terrestrial and freshwater uh, biodiversity. There is also direct exploitation, uh, for example, um, overfishing, uh, which is the main driver for biodiversity loss at the marine, uh, for the marine ecosystems. Uh, overfishing is uh, really the, the main pressure on this environment. There is also climate change. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I, no. Uh, there is also climate change. I think you all know how we are impacted by climate change, uh, but uh, sometimes we forget to think how um, plants and animals are uh, impacted by climate change. Obviously they cannot adapt as well as we can. They don't have technology. So when it's uh, extreme events, when it's hotter, uh, it's way di more difficult for plants and animals to, to adapt. So it's a huge factor of biodiversity loss at the terrestrial level, but also at the marine level. Pollutions, meaning pollution of air, of water, of soil is also a big uh, biodiversity loss driver. And also invasive uh, alien species, uh, for example, when you get, um, uh, the Asian wasp, sorry, I don't, I forgot the name, but in Europe, uh, it will have huge damage. Um, there's also some plants that come and that can just grow everywhere. And then you lose all the um, original biodiversity and you are just uh, kept with one single plant that is uh, in the environment and, and all the other have disappeared. So this is also a big uh, problem today. Uh, to, to have put and all of this obviously comes from um, uh, the way we live today and the way we are converting space spaces uh, spaces to 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 have more productivities and the way we are also driving climate change and uh, generating pollutions uh, so what I was trying to show you is that uh, today businesses uh, they have uh, both impacts and dependencies on biodiversity. They are both using biodiversity, but they are also impacting it. And um, and this means that there is a lot of costs and benefits to um, either uh, continuing to, to, to impact biodiversity, but also uh, trying to protect biodiversity will, can also benefit a lot of businesses. So there is a lot of uh, risks and opportunities for our business and thus we will come back to that but a lot of risk and opportunities for the finance sector um, so what are uh, the risks identified for the economic se sector 
uh, Davos, which is not the most um, ecological activist uh, of <laughs> all the, the forums that exist. As identified biodiversity loss as the top priority uh, since 2020. So this is um, a, both a good thing and an alarming thing that biodiversity is on top of the economic agenda uh, since 2020. It's kept in this area since 2020. Uh, but biodiversity loss it is both um, very uh, identified as the main risk in terms of impact it will have on the economy or it already has on the economy. And also on like on uh, likelihood, meaning we know that it's happening. It's just like um, extreme weather. It's just like uh, knowing that we will not reach our climate action goals. Uh, we know that biodiversity loss is already happening. Uh, so it's today a top priority for uh, even the World Economic Forum and even even the the world economic leaders. Uh, what are the risks for uh, the businesses, um, there is physical risk to biodiversity loss. As we were seeing at the beginning, we use biodiversity uh, on a daily basis uh, to get food, but also to provide for some entrance from some, for some um, businesses, uh, but also to regulate all our environment. So if uh, we lose some part of biodiversity, for example, um, water is not filtrated uh, before um, it enters uh, in, a, uh, in a manufacturing uh, center. It can be a problem for the manufacturing center and they will have to, to, to change the way they operate. Or if we don't have uh, cotton or wheat at some point in the year because of extreme events, because of the loss of uh, cultures, uh, there will be physical risks and damage to the operational chain. Uh, there is also what we call transition risks. Uh, so when a company uh, impacts uh, biodiversity, um, there will be uh, a lot of new regulation, a lot of new awareness on the market and transition risk is basically every other stakeholders being aware of what state we are and what are the impacts from the company and the company not reacting as it should on this topic and thus facing uh, some legal risk or market risk or reputational risk or even technology risk if they don't sh shift at the right time. For example, staying uh, using um, um, fossil fuel um, technology, uh, en energy-based uh, uh, fossil fuel based energy, for example, instead instead of shifting to the right technology at the right time. And um, the uh, I didn't say, but this classification comes from the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosure. Sorry, it's really a mouthful, but uh, it's um, the, the body that is trying to uh, explain what are uh, the risks and uh, to explain to companies how they can explain this risk and report on these risks uh, to the financial institutions. So it's um, a really important uh, task force that is uh, currently working on all these definitions. And they also identify systemic risks, um, which is that at some point, uh, if we keep losing biodiversity, it's not a risk for one business at one time, but it could be a full ecosystem collapse uh, or a full contagion, uh, meaning that uh, you have one business that is down, but then there is a lot of financial repercussion uh, coming from that. Um, so yeah, there could be more of systemic damage uh, to the economy. Um, biodiversity is also seen as a lot of opportunities for businesses uh, being able to transition to, to more efficient services and to get some uh, resource efficiency when you start to really work on what you use, how you use um, biodiversity and how to Im you impact it. Um, there's a lot of market opportunities. People are starting to be aware 
of uh, biodiversity loss and uh, they are looking for less resource intense products and services. They are looking for green solutions and today they are even looking on nature-based solution. For example, uh, nature-based solution are when you use nature to, um, for example, capture carbon or to filtrate water, uh, just using nature freely to um, have a service from that. Uh, financing opportunities also because finance, as we will see, is moving uh, fast forwards and there is also resilience and reputation, obviously, uh, as other opportunities. Uh, now we can uh, start to, to see a bit what the tools and how the tools can be used. What I uh, propose to you is that uh, we will try to use the Encore database to identify some, um, some issues. Uh, ANCOR stands for Exploring Natural Capital Opportunities, Risks and Exposure. It has been uh, created uh, in 2018, if I'm not mistaken, uh, by the uh, Natural Capital Finance Alliance, um, uh, which was rep mainly represented by the environmental program from the United Nations. Um, and uh, it's a free online tool. So what I will um, ask you to do is to go on Encore and we will uh, try to look at some uh, sectors. I will just send you the main link in the chat so you don't have to write it, it will be easier. Uh, and you, if you follow the link, you should uh, be able to reach this page um, and without any login or registration uh, you can already see that you can uh, explore and uh, try to put a sector or sub-industry and to see uh, impacts or dependencies so what I will propose to you is to choose a sector or sub-industry of in interest among all the sub-industries you have and to just explore the, the results. And you can put explore. And then uh, maybe I will let you go there, make sure you are all on the page. And when you are here, you can put uh, either impacts on dependencies and then you can uh, explore a bit uh, by clicking on showing uh, the, the, the dependencies. And you can see that you will have a materiality rating uh, that will appear um, when you just click on the, on the thing. And uh, this is um, to, to show a bit uh, how much uh, sector is uh, dependent or is using uh, this ecosystem. So right here I've used um, a retail sector. So there's not a lot of dependencies and we see that it's very low um, for, the, um, for the pure remediation uh, dependency. And that is, uh, low for the mass stabilization that can be necessary for infrastructure holding. Uh, and you can also go and see the impact that it has. And here we can see that, for example, drug retails, it has a high impact on water use um, and a medium impact on uh, pollutants that are not uh, GHG. Did everyone manage to, to go on Encore and to select a... Yeah, I see. Yeah. yeah, I'm checking it out now. Um, it's fascinating to see how many subsectors there are. And then yeah. could, you, could you tell us a little bit about the asset section? What is that exactly? Yeah, uh, you mean the, the production process or... Oh no, no here. Yeah. yeah. And then... Yeah. Um, 
the the asset section uh, the goal is to um, not go from impact drivers such as I was mentioning to you what are use pollution soil but to see what parts of the ecosystem will be damaged uh, will it be the atmosphere will it be the habitat will it be the land uh, will it affect minerals will it affect salt species water so it's uh, just to make the link between uh, the impacts and what is really impacted. Um, I can show you when you... Um, when you... Um, when you connect and you have an account, uh, you can um, you can see flowcharts that are quite interesting uh, when you select some um, document some some activities. You can see this kind of flowcharts, and you see, for example, this is for um, agricultural business. You will put all the activities from the act agricultural business, for example, and you can see that uh, which process are taking to account here and which one are impacting what and how this is then impacting species, habitats, water, soil. Uh, so it's really the pollution that will damage uh, all of it. And we can see that the main damage from agriculture will be on species more than habitat or water. Um, today, Encore is really a tool we will talk a bit more about it, but it's really a tool that is used by financial actors because it gives an overview for a sector. It's not really specific for one company because you, are, you just have some information of what could be the impacts of dependencies from your sector, but uh, it's a pretty good tool when you are a financial institution, you want to know uh, which of the sectors you are investing in have the most impact or dependencies on biodiversity and you can use uh, this tool. Um, yeah, I'm also curious, Mariana, do you have, uh, did you know this tool before? One thing that's interesting to me about this is looking at the industry of like um, financial institutions. Mm -hmm how little <laughs> there is within that industry. And then it clicked to me, it was like, oh, no wonder this isn't as big a topic for like bankers or stuff. They're just not feeling it to their bottom line. Well, while you look at real estate or you look at um, farming, that, that that's where biodiversity really has an impact. Yeah. Uh, one interesting thing about Encore is at the time they only show direct impact, so meaning from direct operation. So from financing institution, they will not look at uh, where the money is invested or what you ne will need to build the buildings, but just the footprint they have on their direct operation. So just a few buildings with a few computers with some en energy use. So obviously it's not much impact and it's not much dependence. If tomorrow we live in a world that is uh, pretty dead, uh, but we can still use computers to, to trade money and uh, there will be no problem. But uh, if tomorrow uh, we have the, the same circumstances, uh, obviously an agriculture uh, in, in, the, in a farm, you, you won't have the, the same, uh, you would, won't be facing the same reality you will have a lot of problems or even if you are working uh, outside for example in construction you need water you need to be protected from uh, damages from extreme events you need um, some time to get some construction materials and that kind of thing so uh, you are way more uh, impacted by that yeah guys do you hear me I don't know why I lost you. <laughs> I hear you, but I can't, I couldn't go back. I went to the Encore link and now I, I lost your presentation. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I know you asked me a question, but I'm trying to get back in. <laughs> and I, oh wait, I'm opening it now. Sorry yeah. about that. Stefan was just wondering if you had uh, ever used uh, this tool Encore before. 
Yeah, no, I haven't. It's the first time I see it, honestly. How can I okay, go good. Back? Is there, why did I, I don't know how I got out. I think you can come back by just clicking on the Zoom. Uh, I'm there, but I, I don't know why. Open Zoom, it's already open. Continue, don't worry about me. I'll figure it out <laughs> sometime soon, I hope. Okay. Um, I'm back. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> um, I had a thing, it's very interesting. Very, I'm gonna um, look into it some more. Great. Uh, here you can see a bit of a mapping of what sectors will show us with high impacts and high uh, dependencies on Encore. Uh, it's a graph that has been done by the um, uh, UNEP-FI, uh, so the Environmental Program of the United Nations uh, Finance side. And you can see a lot of um, impacts uh, from agriculture, as I was saying, but also energy, mining, transportation, apparel, chemicals, and a lot of dependencies from uh, the activities that are way closer to the ground and that are way more exposed to natural um, catastrophes and exposed to nature, basically. So agriculture is really dependent on biodiversity, but also energy and uh, utilities also, because they need a stable environment to operate. Uh, so this is uh, quite interesting uh, overview of what could be the the main sectors that are most at risk for biodiversity and it's often used uh, by uh, investors just to see which participation which sectors are uh, the most at risk um, then one other thing uh, that is really important is that today biodiversity risk is also location specific. Uh, it's not like climate change. We don't do not um, anywhere we are in the world. It's the same impact that we have if we emit uh, GHG emission for biodiversity. It's not the same. If you pollute somewhere, it may it will not have the same impact that if you then if you pollute somewhere else or if you artificialize somewhere, it will not have the same impact. Um, so um, there is a really other good tool to, to see that, and it's a biodiversity risk filter. Uh, it just came out uh, in January this year. Uh, it's uh, done by the WWF. Uh, they have done the water risk filter before, and now they have extended it to, to biodiversity. And the goal is to be able to assess local risks um, and uh, to prioritize sites where you would have the most risks, for example. So uh, it's the same thing. You can go on the link. I will send it to you in the chat. And um, here, yeah, I think I, you will have to go. Uh, yeah, I think I have a better link because else you, you don't know where to click. This link is better because uh, else you have to click on on several stuff to, to get there. Uh, but basically, uh, without an account, uh, don't hesitate to create an, an account. It's just like Encore, it's free and you can explore a lot more when you have an account. But just for the sake of time here, uh, we will go on the one that doesn't uh, require an account. You can go on map um, here and you can search anywhere in the world and you will have uh, some information of the risk. So if I search Lyon, because I'm in Lyon, um, I will show, it will show a map of Lyon. And then I can uh, look for some risks. So is there any risk for water scarcity in Lyon? We are mostly good. Is there any risk of uh, limited white flora and fauna availability in Lyon? No, we are good. We are not in the red part, or at least there's no information. Uh, is there any in, uh, problem with air condition in Lyon? Yes, there is, because it's a big city. 
uh, is there any Briscoflin slides? Uh, yes, in not in the city, but in some parts, yes. And you can also find stuff on the reputational risk. So is there any uh, protected areas around? So if you have an impact, you will have uh, more publicity or it may be uh, even more damaging if you are in a protected area and you make some pollutions. Uh, or is there any problem with labor and human rights? Uh, here we have quite low risks. Or is there anything on political situation? So this uh, tool is really interesting because you can uh, just cross an activities uh, that you had before. You know, for example, um, the construction sector, uh, they are really dependent on uh, water and they are really dependent on mass stabilization. And then you can go on this tool, biodiversity risk filter and see if there is actual a uh, risk of landslide or if there is an actual risk of uh, water availability. Um, and yeah, you can see in different places in the world, you won't have uh, obviously the, the, the same um, impact. Like in Helsinki, maybe more or less the same, but yeah. So I, I think it's a really also complementary um, tools <laughs> and yes when you and if you want the overall risks you can just um, uh, check the the first map which is escape physical risks and then you will have the the an overview of physical risks and we see that there are a lot of places in the world where there are a lot of physical risks linked to biodiversity and you can have the same with um, escaping repet a repetition a repetitional risks, so linked with impacts, where you can see that where there are a lot of protected and natural areas uh, and a lot of uh, protection issues, uh, you will have a more red. <laughs> Do not click on view also marine areas. Oh, yeah, here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I, it's a really recent tool, uh, but I think it will be really widely used by investors to be able to quickly, uh, if you cross what you get from Encore and the risks, you can really have something that is quite interesting to know what which sector we are in and what are the associated risks and as you can see there is a lot of red but it's also good because it means that we will have this topic on high alerts and that investors and uh, companies can start to take really this into account and not just say oh there is no risk or biodiversity loss it's a risk for tomorrow it's not something urgent because it appears already in red on so many aspects so Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm noticing that it, the data is also very, very granular. Like I was looking at the Amazon and you can really see like where the deforestation has happened um, yeah. and the communities, like how it's like spread up the different rivers or different the, the cities that go further and further into the ecosystems. Yeah. Well, I'm from Colombia, as I told you. And uh, we, part of our frontier is completely um, with the Amazon. So we are a part of the Amazon. And uh, it's, it's so frustrating because unfortunately, we are a very corrupt uh, country, as is Brazil and many other countries in the world. But in our region, there's a lot of corruption uh, and there are many laws, many regulations, rules and regulations, all to protect the Amazon. And there are so many efforts um, going on to protect it. But then on the other hand, there are so many uh, 
created interests of people just violating regulations with corruptions, with money to uh, increase deforestation for their own interest. So it's such a complex topic. It's very complex and very sad. Um, there are many people working hard for it, which is the good part. But I mean, if we really want to achieve results that are worthy, the balance ha has to go more towards the protection and we need a lot of international cooperation for it. But it's, it's very frustrating because there's a lot of corruption. So that means we all need to work hard on it every day more. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana, for, for sharing that. that. That's so true that a uh, lot of political issues also come in, in the balance and that even if uh, companies and investors want sometimes to do the good thing, it's really hard to, to enforce uh, stuff if you don't have motivation on the political level and that everybody is trying to. And there's a lot of politics around it. For example, I mean, Colombia is a very corrupt country. But Brazil, with Bolsonaro, when he was the president, um, Joao, I don't know where Joao is from, but that's a very Portuguese name. That must be Portugal or Brazil. Um, Brazil, uh, with Bolsonaro, he's very capitalist. So he encouraged, during his government, he encouraged a lot, a lot of deforestation just for capitalistic um, um, uh, means, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's super sad and well, let's see what happens now. But, but yeah, it's, it's a world issue. So let's see how we evolve if we achieve results. Right now I'm seeing a lot of, did you see what's happening in Italy, for example, with the uh, water, the, uh, the dryness, uh, how do you say, I, I'm trying to translate from Spanish. Sequia is lack of water or dryness. No. The, the canals, the canals, the, the canals, for example, in Venice and everything, they're drying up. Yeah. We're gonna be having, a lot of extreme water issues. Yeah, too in, much water in, or too much dryness. Yeah, in all West Europe, we are at really critical points where we experience a really dry summer, and now we are experiencing a really dry winter. So there is no water at the moment, and uh, exactly. in the and yeah, in Italy, in France, also in Germany. And it's gonna be more extreme every time. So yeah. we have a lot of work to do, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's sure. At least a small grain of sand. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I believe it's really uh, interesting to at least to, to take all of that into account and see all of the differences we have also all across the world, but also what are the stage uh, in every part of the world. And also to understand when you are a company or fin financial institution that you don't have to look only one location because your supplier maybe and probably have the most impact or the most dependencies and you will have to locate your value chain at some point or at least the most critical activities of your value chain. And this is also something that is really hard at the moment and really difficult is to being able to locate uh, your own activities, but also being able to locate your value chain uh, to understand the different risks that uh, can be associated with it. Um, so what is the, the link with uh, financial institutions? Um, as we, we can understand uh, the, the physical risk, the transition risks, uh, systemic risks and opportunities are at the level of companies, but they uh, mean that there are um, macroeconomic and microeconomic uh, transmission channel 
to the financial sectors uh, with the demand that is changing with the price volatility, so the asset value, the change in profitability, the disruption of activities, and then you will have some uh, real risk and opportunities at the market level for the credit, for the liquidity, and even at the operational level for financial institutions. So it's all um, connected and obviously a risk for the companies is also a risk for, for the financial institutions. Um, so today, investors are quickly engaging on biodiversity. I say especially in France because we have managed to pass a law in France on the topic, which is uh, one kind in the world. Uh, uh, hopefully more states will try to, to do that, more countries. But uh, today there is a COP15 that has been trying to say that we need to finance more uh, biodiversity protection and to reduce uh, harmful subsidies for uh, on biodiversity. Um, there is also the European taxonomy uh, that aims at identifying which kind of activities have a positive impact on biodiversity. Uh, it's already done and kind of done for climate uh, and it will be uh, there will be a list of positive activities for biodiversity there is already a draft that is available um, in France we as I was saying we have a law now that requires that most investors disc disclose their biodiversity footprint of their portfolio so are able to say uh, where does the impact on biodiversity come from and where does the dependency come from? And they have to disclose nature-related risks and they have to disclose how they align with global goals. So mainly the COP15 uh, coming Montreal Agreement. Um, and there is uh, what I was mentioning, the discourse on nature-related financial disclosure. Uh, that is not any regulation or a political tool, but it's uh, an international standard that provides guidance uh, for uh, companies and financial institutions on how to uh, assess uh, nature risk and opportunities and how to build a good biodiversity or nature uh, governance. Um, and thus, we have seen response of investors that are starting to, to use biodiversity impact assessment tools. Um, yeah, uh, I will show them a bit more uh, just after, but now we have some tools. Uh, we have Encora, as I just saw, uh, showed you, but we have also some quantitative tools to be able to uh, do just like we do a carbon footprint, but on biodiversity. And um, they, it's also really interesting because investors are starting to ask uh, for their companies they invest in to disclose uh, their biodiversity footprints and their policies. So it's not just the financial institution that have to work on this, but it's also the companies that they finance and thus the big companies are moving. And when the big companies are moving, the smaller companies are moving also. So it's really um, uh, something that uh, accelerates the, the whole um, way of being aware of biodiversity loss and how we can manage it and what are the risks. We've really seen in France with um, uh, this uh, new law uh, that has been implemented in last year, uh, we've really seen that the companies have starting to, to be aware of this law and have started to really try to disclose that their biodiversity footprint and be able to answer to investors on their risks and they have starting to, to work and to accelerate the, their work on that. Um, so what tools can be used? Um, I will just uh, show you uh, something. <laughs> we are uh, almost already out of time, but um, it's a lot of extract from a guidance I uh, wrote with uh, France Invest, which is a French group of investors. But uh, luckily, we did a guidance uh, that is in English. If you manage to go on the bottom of the page, you can find it in English. Uh, but I will just show you the main element from this guidance. You can have all the details 
uh, in this uh, guide. But uh, what we say is basically that the first thing to do when you are um, a financial institution and you want to know how to improve your impact is to set uh, positive and negative screening. Uh, so what it means, it means that you will try to finance more positive, um, um, positive impact uh, companies and you will try to stop financing negative impact companies. So what you can do is to use the European taxonomy uh, where you will um, try to um, to um, find activities that have a good impact on the environment. For example, all the activities that uh, use restoration or rehabilitation will have a positive impact on biodiversity. And you can also uh, use um, try to uh, base your positive screening on uh, companies that say that they are working on, uh, for example, SDG 14 or SDG 15 uh, that are positive on biodiversity. Um, so this can be a first way. And the second thing is to try to avoid or reduce the investment on um, activities that will impact uh, biodiversity so you can exclude all activities that work in protected areas for example US, IUCN categories uh, one two or three um, you can also ban some uh, unsustainable fishing practice or ban certain activities related to animal furs or uh, ban certain activities related to production of GMOs uh, so there are a lot of exclusions that you can do it's not as simple as with the climate where you can just say, I will stop financial, financial fossil fuel because the most impacting uh, sector is agriculture. And we will not say we will stop financing agriculture because we don't want everybody to starve. Uh, but we, you will more mostly focus on uh, stopping some activities or in some parts of the world. Um, so this can be the, the negative thing you can have as an investor. Uh, obviously, you can also move the way you are doing your environmental, social and governance analysis um, by asking, asking some question on biodiversity, uh, like do you uh, have any risks in relation on biodiversity uh, um, relating to dependencies, relating to impacts or relating to the location of your assets? Uh, do you have targets uh, or a management system for biodiversity related issues? Do you monitor environmental indicators? Um, and according to what the company says, you can assess if you want this company or no in your um, portfolio. And then you can say if you, uh, the investors can uh, hopefully have a more, uh, uh, a less risky portfolio regarding biodiversity issues. Um, and obviously you will take all of this into account, take uh, which sector are the most risky and you will not ask the same question to the different sectors, because you know that uh, if you are investing in an agriculture company, in a farm, you will ask a lot of questions about biodiversity, but maybe if you are investing in a um, tertiary company uh, that focuses on services with little uh, commodities use and little probable impact on biodiversity, then you will ask a lot less question on the topic. So you will have to, um, to ask a good question to the good sectors and the good companies. So a lot of investors are, sa are starting to ask specific question and to look more in details to impact and dependencies for this priority sectors. Um, and then uh, the investors have their um, this uh, opportunities and most of the time when they are in acquisition phase to set targets for the company and to ask them to set new targets and say, I will invest in you if you uh, commit on this topic, if you try to reach this topic or if you become best in class on this topic. So this is also um, something you can do. Um, I wanted to, to show you uh, um, a, a, a database for a benchmark based uh, 
uh, I don't think we have the time, so I will just send you the link. You can look at it uh, later, but it's basically um, uh, a benchmark that has been done on a lot of companies in the world. And you can see uh, the, the nature impact um, and you can see the, the ranking and you have uh, what they are currently the, doing on their governance and strategy on nature, what they are doing on ecosystem and biodiversity and social inclusion community impact. So yeah, it's, uh, I will say maybe not the best benchmark in the world, but it exists and it covers a lot of companies and you have a lot of information of what is doing. They say that caring is probably the most uh, nature friendly company uh, that they assess um, here. And they can uh, give you some interesting information on why they are ranked so, uh, so high. Um, sorry, I'm so up there. But you can, um, yeah, see what they are doing on governance that they have uh disclosing their materiality assessment that they are trying to reduce CHG, that they are trying to have uh nature related impacts uh divided uh by 40 persons so you have a lot of information of, on what they are doing and it can give you a lot of uh, information on what a company can do uh, on biodiversity Um, and then just a few words on the holding periods. So when you are invested in a company, there is period where, where you are just an investor. So uh, you can be on the board, for example, and that's a really good opportunity to dialogue with the company and to be able to uh, promote biodiversity and to ask some question on the topic um, and to make sure that they are working on the CSR and biodiversity roadmap, uh, that they are implementing a biodiversity strategy. And you can also assist the company by identifying their risks and helping them do that. And today I, think I see a lot of investors that have a lot of, um, um, yeah, <laughs> I could stay a, a bit longer, but um, to answer some some question also, um, and um, yeah, uh, it's really important today in holding period to to be able also to to work on on the topic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Mariana. Yes, uh, Fanny, I have a question for you for Stephen, and everybody's welcome to answer. I am interested in furthering my education related to everything biodiversity protection, be it finance or all the topics surrounding it. Um, um, do you have any suggestions, any advice? Uh, can, can we talk directly about it or what do you suggest? I don't have a uh, curriculum ideas or this, but I know there are lots of resources today uh, with the TNFD, with the um, the UNEPFI also is uh, working a lot on the topic. Um, I I could give you a lot of resources. I think uh, to to enrich your your knowledge on the topic. Yeah. How can I contact you? Yeah, I, I can give you my email here. Um, here. I take pictures of everything. Oh, great. Wonderful. I can send you back all of this literature. Uh, and it's all, I believe a lot of literature is also in the in the guidance uh, from France Invest. Sorry, the, the page is in French, but the guidance at the end is in English. <laughs> so you should be able to, to find it. And there is a lot of resources uh, written in the in the guide also. It's, it, uh, there are links to Encore, there are links to TNFD, there are links to all of that. I speak French, so there's no problem. Oh, great. Oui, je parle français, je te dis à la Sorbonne. Super. Et à l'Eurocentre à Paris. Great. 
Great, thanks so much. And, and yeah, I, I definitely want to further my education on biodiversity. Great, I'm happy to, to help you in any way. I, I don't know any good curriculum on the topic or a good uh, uh, masterclass or even online classes. Uh, it's a really emerging topic, but maybe Stephen or uh, others know good um, classes on the topic. No, I haven't found a course on this. I agree that it is something very relevant, especially on the part when it comes to investing. Like I've heard a few lectures that are one off, um, but you you covered a lot of it. I think it's important for us to know the science um, and then to know like the risks and opportunities. And then the next part is the key part of like, what can we do? Um, and I don't know how much more you wanted to share with us, but that was a, a question that I thought we could spend a little time on. It's like, what, what can we do? Like me as an individual, but then too, how do we motivate the corporations and investors to, to make big changes? Yeah, uh, I can just go through uh, the rest quickly. There's no many other slides, uh, so I can go through them quickly and then we can uh, dive on, on this question. Um, yeah, um, just in exit phase, what we say that to um, um, accentuate what has been done and highlight uh, what has been done and make it a real asset for a company that it has work on biodiversity <laughs> and uh, make it an opportunity and not just a risk management. Um, yeah, uh, concluding remark, this is what I've been <laughs> showing you, but it's in the guide. Uh, there is also the, the resource right here. And um, yeah, another key element uh, is that we will need investors to, to work on biodiversity protection. protection. Um, there is, um, it's closed, sorry. Um, there is a gap on financing biodiversity that is pretty huge. <laughs> Uh, 700 billion dollars a year are missing to protect biodiversity according to uh, what we want for biodiversity protection and especially when we consider uh, the new targets uh, from the, the COP15 on biodiversity and what they say is that we will really need to increase the financing on biodiversity, increase it by at least uh, 200 billions and to reduce the harmful subvention of, on biodiversity by 500 billion uh, each year. And there is also a real issue to be able to send the money at the right place uh, at the right time. So it was a lot talked about during COP15, uh, how we can finance um, and help the source uh, to keep developing, but still protecting biodiversity when we had, have a lot of money coming from the north and how we can make it efficient. Um, so yeah, there is also a, a really uh, important aspect here. Um, and yeah, uh, I wanted to, to conclude on one key thing that is that to reduce negative impacts, investors have to understand them and include them in their financial risk analysis. So um, assessing this risk need to be like assessing any other risk when you are investing. It's not just like a CSR topic or something else that you do, but it should be seen as a real risk, as a real economical risk, because we depend on biodiversity. There are some transition risks. So it's not... Um, just a matter of ethics and saving the planet. It's really an economical risk for uh, the company and the, the, the investors. So they have to start to understand that and to take it into account uh, with the financial point of view. Um, yeah, so that was the, the end of my uh, presentation, maybe uh, to, to answer you, Stephen, on what we can do as uh, individual and then as companies and then as uh, investors, um, as individuals, I think we we are already trying to do a lot on our carbon footprint. Uh, at least, hopefully, everyone uh, here is trying to do a lot. The good thing is, carbon footprint is one of the big impacts on biodiversity. So you are already doing a lot of things that are good for uh, biodiversity. 
Um, and also a lot of things that are good for carbon footprint reduction uh, is also good for a lot of other things like reducing, reducing pollutions or reducing the footprint uh, on earth and the land conversion that may occur. So every time you choose to recycle, every time you choose to not buy something, every time you choose to yeah, just not participating participate in more extraction and uh, more uh, mass production, you are basically uh, helping biodiversity as well as your carbon footprint. So um, uh, I hope <laughs> a lot of us are already trying to do it. We, we have to continue to do that and to uh, stop having only the carbon footprint in mind, but also think about other pollutions, our use of water, and our um, impact we can have on um, the, the land conversion. For example, if you have a small green space uh, near you at your home or uh, maybe at your university, uh, you can try to work it to have more biodiversity on site uh, with, for example, stop cutting uh, the grass uh, so often. Uh, having uh, more native trees, na native vegetation, and to try to bring back some vegetation. And the best thing you can do is to just uh, try to have less concrete as possible and not, um, how do you say, uh, waterproof uh, everything. So this is, I think, the big mind change we, we have to have is to also think about uh, land conversion because it's often forgotten as an environmental issue. Uh, we talk a lot about, uh, usually it's uh, carbon, water, waste, and uh, pollution. And we ha really have to add uh, land conversion and the impact we have on land and on just being sure that the cycle of water works well and that we have a lot of uh, vegetation and we are able to welcome as much as animals as possible on every square meter uh, now. So yeah, this is for the thing you can do as an individual, then as a company or as an investor, I would say try to identify the most impact uh, thing that you do. And um, you can use the dependency side just to understand how much you need biodiversity and if it helps in the discourse and in the way you will present things, but the urgency is to reduce the impact that we have. So the first thing to ask is what may be the impact? Uh, you probably already know a lot of it on carbon footprint, but just the same, ask yourself, uh, do, do my company, uh, is my company also using a lot of water? for me or on my supply chain? Uh, are we also polluting? What kind of pollution and where does it occur? And are we also participating in land conversion in deforestation, uh, all that kind of changing the way we use the land? And yeah, this, in, this is really the first step to then be able to, to set targets, <laughs> hopefully manage to, to set targets that, has, uh, that are uh, ambitious enough. Um, I was sending you, to you just before the work of the Science-Based Target Network. Um, they are starting to work on what could be uh, goals and targets that companies can set that would be ambitious enough considering planetary boundaries and ecological limits. Um, the methodology is still a work in progress. Uh, it's not very user-friendly at the moment, but hopefully more and more uh, companies will try it, will use it, and uh, it will be easier to say, oh, we don't just need to use less water, but we need to use 40% uh, less water in this basin because it's a critical risk, or we need to use 30% less water in this basin because it's at this stage, and we can go with just reducing by 5% in this basin because it's not so so critical. Or we need to focus on, uh, we need to set a zero deforestation target, but also maybe a zero conversion target in other commodities or in other uh, aspects. So yeah, it's pretty um, interesting work that they are doing, even if it's uh, still a work in progress. 
uh, hopefully this <laughs> answers your, your question and I'm happy to, to answer any other question if you still have a bit of time. Fanny, I loved your presentation. Thank you, Mariana. Thank you so much. And always to Steven, include me in everything. <laughs> Especially if it's biodiversity related. Great. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Mariana. And Steven. Yeah. You know, what is coming up for me is that just what you've been mentioning right now, also with biodiversity, just as with climate change or carbon in particular. There's such a risk to silo that in a way, you know, to just fall into the same old loophole of just looking at the number and not seeing the connections or how it all just is one web basically and how one thing is triggering the other and how we cannot, yes, we can do some estimations, but the complexity of life is just so complex that we, yeah, cannot really say though. Mm, so what is coming up for me just is one observation is that I feel like with with this development um, we're creating a biodiversity of, of 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 tools of languages to talk about the same thing and I think that is important so like having more and more ways to show but more and more and more tools to to act and we need the biodiversity of that in a way um, and the second thing is just what like I would be very interested how how your clients how, how organizations like companies private sector and also the financial industry if you're working with investors and so on how do they respond and how do they activate the topic actually in the end yeah uh, this is really interesting because on biodiversity we cannot wait to have one number or find the perfect number and it will never be possible to have uh, we already know that the CO2 equivalent is not the best thing. We use it, but it's not really what is the best, but we use it because we want a number and we think we need a number. But on biodiversity, we will never have this kind of number because it's so complex and it's uh, way more difficult to compare pollution to GHG emission to water use to exploitation. Um, we, we have some metrics that can be used, but um, it's it's really not about the number, then understanding what can be probably the priorities and to focus our efforts on the right thing and make sure that we, uh, because we don't have so much time, that we don't lose time on, on things that are really small. So this is what is really interesting right now is that the tools are developing to understand better what are our prior priorities, but we don't have to wait for the perfect matrix and the perfect understanding to start acting. We already know that a lot of stuff is working, like uh, using less resources, like using less energy, like uh, just, um, I'm not an advocate for degrowth, but I'm reading a lot about uh, how we should slow down just basically our economy and um, make more use of our resources and um, yeah, just slow down our the way we live. And I think it makes a lot of sense to, to see that some actions like that, there are, we cannot put a number on how much they reduce the impact. But we know, but we know it's good uh, on several levels, and we have to focus on this kind of actions. And to answer your question on how to, yeah, how to talk to company and what are the first steps they they take. The first thing is for them to understand all of that. So uh, this is a presentation I'm not very used to do in English, but I'm very used to do in French, and my boyfriend cannot stand it anymore because I'm doing it like every week. Maybe I'm saying the same stuff, but um, yeah, a lot of companies. The first thing they want uh, us to do is uh, explain to them what is the matter and uh, open their eyes because often they are so deep focused on carbon at the moment because it's a question everybody is uh, asking them uh, that they are happy to, to, to see that the issue is broader 
they also have to be reassured, obviously, that working on carbon is already a good thing. And in most of the game, the action you take on carbon will have good uh, impacts on biodiversity also. So this is really important. Uh, but yes, the way we we do it is also to um, say that it's not something that is uh, philanthropical or ethical, it's really a business matter today uh, to work on biodiversity, that risks are really concrete, financial, there is, uh, as you say, uh, legal pressure and a lot of pressure from different stakeholders to take action. So we try to highlight this and really focus on this when we do a presentation and say, this is a topic and you have to, to work on it, not because it's good for the planet, but because it's good for your company, your economic activity. And today, this is what works. Um, you cannot move a company by saying, unfortunately, by saying it's good for the environment. You can only move them by saying, uh, this is good for your company. And if you want to, to continue your business safely, you, you have to, to do that. And the first thing we, we do usually is to identify main priorities and start then to, 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 to work on it and identify the right goals. Also identify all of that is already uh, in motion in the company and that is moving in the right direction. So if they are doing circular economy, they are doing, um, trying to, um, I don't know, uh, reduce their energy, optimize their resources. All of that is already good if they are probably already are trying to work on their, their grid spaces because it's good for uh, attracting people. So we highlight all of that and we put all of that uh, saying it's a good thing. Uh, and they are already doing a lot, but maybe they are missing some, some really critical and top priority thing that they have to really work on right now. And this is the hard part because we, we have to say, now you cannot just continue to do that and you will have to change progressively over the 10, 15 years to this new business model. And you will not have uh, a choice at some point. Now you have a choice, but at some point you will not have a choice. So do, do the right thing and start to change now. Um, but to do that, there is a lot of work on planning and how everything will be able to move. So yeah, it's a real work to, to start to, to go deep in, a, in an action plan and to identify what to move to be at the right stage where. And I think the most frustrating part of my job is that it's really hard to move a big companies uh, at the pace that it should move if we want to, to achieve and to protect really biodiversity right now. Uh, we are slow and we know that because I work mainly with big companies uh, that have the time to work on biodiversity and the money to work on biodiversity, but still then uh, it's too slow to move. And I think we, yeah, we need to, to, to find also the, the small company, the small alternative uh, way of doing society, way of doing business that is already much more advanced and that will be more, much more quicker to, to change and to adapt. And we just have to, to face that some companies will not be able to change and will probably just uh, face um, the, the, the risk and the consequences of not having change at some point. And, and it's okay, it's just like life. Some companies will have to die and for others to, 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 be, uh, to be able to be born again. So, yeah. Do you have any other question? I unfortunately have to leave now. Thank you so much. I hope to see you soon again. Thank you all. I think then we can uh, stop there. It was really nice to, to have you and to share this with the Oikos community. I'm really happy to, to be able to share on that. And I would be really happy to, to do this another time on investing on our other specific sectors on or a more broader or a more personal level. Happily. Thank you so much, Stephen, Fanny, and so nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fanny. Have a great evening.
thank or you. rest of the day, morning, <laughs> even maybe for some of you. Yes, thank you so much, Fanny. This is really, really great. Um, and I'll definitely share the resources with those who couldn't make it today. Um, definitely sad that they weren't here to answer these questions, ask their questions to you because you have a, all of the wealth of information you have. Um, yeah, I, I second Sophie. We can really hear the passion here. And it's so great to you're sharing these learnings with us um, and these tools. I think that's a good motivation for all of us and um, for our projects in the sustainable finance space. Really appreciate it. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, all.